Wow, this is a great crowd. Any truck drivers here? One, two. Oh, several. Oh, good. Any criticism about my parking job? As I, I did an event the other night. I was in Needham, Massachusetts, and it was really tight. Uh, and I did a horrible parking job. And uh, as soon as I got up here, one of the drivers in the audience said, where'd you learn how to park that thing? So anyway, uh, thanks to the Norwich Police Department for making this possible. I thought it was time for a reasonably literate book about truck drivers. This is, uh, this is etched in the cultural ethos of, the, of America. It's the, the, it comprises the cowboy thing, the go west young man thing, the road trip thing. There's no literature on it. You have, and if whatever, you, whatever there is, you have to go back a certain amount of time. You've got Travels with Charlie, say, which is a great book. Um, Blue Highways, nice book. They're all, um, both of those, though, are more about the things that they see on the road rather than what the life is like for somebody out there who does this kind of work. And I didn't see anything out there like that. So that's kind of why I thought maybe I would give it a try. Maybe we can start a whole genre here. If you don't drive a truck, like any subculture, we have names for people. So if you don't drive a truck, you're called a four-wheeler. If you drive a ambulance, you're called, uh, ambulances are called meat wagons or bone boxes. If you drive an RV with a big trailer behind it, that's called a wiggle wagon. If you drive a school bus, that's called a cheese wagon. And uh, drivers have names, we all have names for other truckers, depending on what they haul, how they're paid, and what they drive. Now, I, I work for a van line. I've always been a mover. I work for a moving company. I move families. That's the only kind of trucking work I've ever done. We're called bed buggers. <laughs> we don't call ourselves bed buggers. Those guys call us bed buggers. Our trucks are called roach coaches. <laughs> if you drive a flatbed truck, you're called a skateboarder. If you drive hazardous materials, you're called a thermos bottle holder. <laughs> if you drive liquid natural gas, you're called a suicide jockey. <laughs> and if you haul live animals, you're called a chicken choker. <laughs> now, there's this whole hierarchy amongst drivers. Um, we, the movers, we think we're at the top, and freight haulers think they're at the top, but nobody thinks that the chicken chokers are at the top. <laughs> In fact, when you're, it's getting harder and harder to park these trucks because there's more and more trucks and fewer and fewer truck stops. And uh, a lot of times they're filled up at like 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. But if there is one space left at a truck stop, it's going to be next to that chicken choker because especially on a summer evening, it has a memorable old factory experience. <laughs> so part of my book is about that. But it's about so much more. Um, it's about work. And it's about how manual work can be a worthy occupation and choice-worthy work. And a little bit in there about how maybe manual work is somewhat devalued in today's society. One of the things I love about manual work is, as a mover, I have to hire crews to because we go into, we invade somebody's house, and then we take all the stuff out, put it into the truck, and then we deliver it somewhere else, usually a long way away. And I get to work these very long, grueling physical days with a group of men and it's kind of tribal, and it's very, very satisfying. And it's not the way that people work much anymore, in groups, doing hard physical stuff. You know, women used to work with women. Men worked with men. Men and women worked together. We sort of missed all that, and I really, really enjoy that part of the work that I do. Another thing about being a mover is I don't drive from terminal to terminal, and I don't live 
on the interstate highway system the way, say, a freight hauling truck driver does. I go where the moves go, so I go into towns, go into communities, and I get to interact with the families that are moving. That's uh, different. Forty-one million Americans move every year. One out of eight of us. That's a lot of discontent. <laughs> and the moving industry is, is opaque. So very few of those 41 million Americans have any idea what they're getting into when they're dealing with a moving company. And none of those 41 million Americans have any idea who's going to pile out of that truck at 8 o'clock in the morning, go into your house and take everything you own and drive away with it. Careful people, people who carry umbrellas and watch the weather forecast, people who lock their doors, people who change their garage door code every month, people that have burglar alarms and turn them on, routinely, daily in this country, turn everything they own over to the movers without a second thought. I think that's very odd. <laughs> movers, we're, we're like morticians and we're lawyers in that hiring one brings up a whole bunch of emotional baggage. It's not something that people do a million times in their lives. So there's a mystery about it that the book also goes into in depth. And moving's tough on families. Often a move is not good news within a family. Often families are displaced. Often a spouse's sense of status as an earner might be threatened. Kids' lives are disrupted. Schools are being changed. Moving's emotionally jarring for the whole family. And part of my job is to help navigate that transition, which is also very satisfying. Now, everybody asks me, if there's one piece of moving advice could, you could give, what would that be? And here's, here's my nugget that nobody takes this advice. Get rid of everything you own and pack a suitcase. <laughs> People get hung up about their stuff. And here's one of the things that I know. Having moved more than 3,000 families, I know that everybody has almost the exact same stuff. And I know where it's all going to end up. There's this continuum in America. So if you're in your 20s and 30s, you're sort of accumulating. And then when you're in your 40s and 50s, you sort of stay even. And then when you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, you start to disaccumulate. And I'm there at every step of this process. And I know that it all goes into the dumpster sooner or later. So <laughs> your Aunt Tilly's antique vanity, it's going away. Your high school yearbook, the kids' paintings that are on the refrigerator with the magnet, the Tupperware that you can't find the right tops for, all that stuff. You might not feel like you're able to bring yourself to throw that stuff away, but, but trust me, your descendants will have no such qualm. <laughs> Movers are Buddhists. We understand the transitory nature of man-made things. And even the guys that I work with, and the people that I work with, so my crews, this is a... Uh, this is indicative of this sort of immigration pattern of, of America. When I first started, the movers were Irish and Italians, and then they were African Americans. Now they're all Hispanics. And it's a way to break into the workforce you know, with a fairly low-skilled job. But even my Hispanic guys, who are at the bottom end of the American dream, these guys aren't collectors either. They might be on a first-name basis with the, with the payday loan guy, but when they're offered the big four, 
which are the four things that movers are offered most often, which are pianos, hot tubs, pool tables, and the backyard trampoline. I could have 10 of those, each of those, but we don't collect those. It's a rare mover who becomes a collector of anything. Also in this book, there's so much in this book. You should buy it, really. <laughs> I started, uh, I got my commercial driver's license in 1980, about three days after my 21st birthday. And back in those days, you could get a commercial driver's license by fogging a mirror. <laughs> I had one, so there's a bunch of orange cones out there on the street you might have seen. I had one orange cone, and the guy said, can you drive around that? And I, and I said, yes, do you want me to do it? And he said, no, here's your license. I, that's how easy it was back then. So that was 1980. So off and on, I've been doing this work. And uh, I've seen some things around the country. I've seen, I've seen the Midwest become denuded of people. I've seen the death throes of hundreds and hundreds of small towns in the face of commercial development and big box retailers on the outskirts that hollow out the inside. I've seen land use choices building low density auto dependent housing development everywhere. I've seen Every hilltop between St. Louis and Santa Barbara strewn with wind turbines. In New England, I've seen the once ubiquitous general store be supplanted by the convenience store. In the heartland of this country, if there is a heartland, it has a stake through it. There's a corn monoculture where you can drive for 250 miles without seeing a sign of human habitation. There's meatpacking plants set well away from prying eyes, and lots of new prisons. I'm not getting any darker than that. <laughs> My book is actually not dark. It's breezy. It's funny most of the time. We'll meet some of the people that I work with and some of the people I work for. We'll meet Tommy Mahoney, my Florida sidekick. I've been working with this guy for decades. He carries around a thermos filled with a vodka and cranberry cocktail. It's called, they call it a Cape Cotter, right? Got a Cape Cotter. He comes to work. He's a, he's, a, he's a lumper. He's not a driver. Just make that clear. He works with it all day long and fills it up a couple times a day. Carries it around like a triathlete carries around a water bottle. We'll meet our genial Bangladeshi doctor from the Bronx, New York, who moves to Utah to become a cowboy. And we'll meet Mrs. Fowler, who can't bring herself to throw anything away. Is that here tonight or in the book? <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about being a truck driver, talk to quite a bit about being a mover. One of the things about being a truck driver that I try to convey is this ocean of disorientation that a driver lives in all the time. I've been out on the road now on this book tour, which is exactly like going around moving people, um, except I don't have to load and unload my truck. But I wake up in one town and then go to another one and wake up in another one, and my anchor actually is the vehicle out there. It's not in the physical universe that maybe most of you folks live in. It's, it's very different, and I explore that a bit. And then truck drivers, there's two and a half million truck drivers in the United States. And believe it or not, we're not some you know, harmonized phalanx of redneck simians, <laughs> predators, strange folks, southern rednecks, western cowboys. There's all those, there are all of those components, but that doesn't comprise two and a half million people. We're really regular people, regular Americans. We have aspirations, we have families, we have emotional lives.
we have fear. And maybe this hasn't occurred to you folks, but if it's a dark and stormy night and you see that big truck out there and you don't want it to be in front of you or you don't want it to be behind you, maybe think about, maybe I'm scared. Maybe I don't like driving in that weather. Maybe I don't want to be going down that hill. Maybe I don't want to see your brake lights. So just a couple things to keep in mind. I'm going to do a I'm going to read just a little bit and then we can have a little chat if you like. What I have found is uh some people have these burning questions that have been in their minds for decades about truck drivers. <laughs> so if you have any of those um in a few minutes that might be the appropriate time to solve that mystery. Or uh we have a couple of drivers out here. Maybe we can all answer some of these questions together. So I'm going to do a short reading. Loveland Pass, Colorado, on US Route 6, summits at 11,991 feet. That's where I'm headed. At the top of the pass, high up in my Freightliner Cascadia tractor, pulling a spanking new custom moving van, I reckon I can say I'm at 12,000 feet. When I look down, the world disappears into a miasma of fog and wind and snow. It's July. <laughs> the road signs are clear enough. First one says, runaway truck ramp, one and a half miles. <laughs> Next one, speed limit, 35 miles an hour for vehicles over 26,000 pounds. Next one, are your brakes cool and adjusted? Next one, all commercial vehicles are required to carry chains. I run through these signs in my mind. Hmm, one and a half miles to the runaway ramp sounds really far. 35 miles an hour downhill sounds really fast. My brakes are cool, but adjusted? Nobody signs off on brake adjustments in these litigious days. Chains? I have chains. They're in my equipment compartment. I figure the bad weather will last for only the first thousand feet. The practical aspects of putting on chains in a snowstorm with no pullover spot in pitch dark at 12,000 feet in a gale wearing a t-shirt <laughs> is a prospect Dante probably never considered in enumerating his circles of hell. <laughs> the other option is to keep on rolling. So I roll. I can feel the sweat running down my arms. I can feel my hands shaking. I can taste the bile rising in my throat from the greasy burger I ate at the Idaho Springs Carl's Jr. It was the only place I could park. I've got eight miles of seven and a half percent downhill grade ahead of me that has taken more trucks and more lives than I care to think about. The road surface is a mixture of rain, slush, and probably ice. I downshift my 13-speed transmission to fifth gear, slow to 23 miles an hour, and set the jake brake to all eight cylinders. A jake brake is an air compression inhibitor that turns my engine into the primary braking system. It sounds like a machine gun beneath my feet as it works to keep 80,000 pounds of steel and rubber under control. I watch the tachometer, which tells me my engine speed. And when it redlines at 2200 RPMs, I'm at 28 miles an hour. I brush the brakes to bring her back down to 23 miles an hour. If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen now. My tender touch might cause the heavy trailer to slide away, and I'll be able to read the logo in reverse legend from my mirrors. It's called a jackknife. 
Once it starts, you can't stop it. In a jackknife, the trailer comes all the way around, takes both lanes, and crushes against the cab until the whole thing comes to a crashing stop at the bottom of the abyss or against the granite side of the Rockies. It doesn't happen this time, but the weather's getting worse. I hit 28 miles an hour again, caress the brake back down to 23, start the sequence again. Fondle the brake, watch the mirrors, feel the machine, check the tack, listen to the jake, watch the air pressure. The air gauge read 120 pounds per square inch at the summit, now it reads 80. At 60, an alarm will go off, and at 40, the brakes will automatically lock or just give up. Never mind that now, just don't go past 28 and keep coaxing her back down to 23. I'll do this 20 or 30 times over the next half an hour, never knowing if the trailer will hit a bit of ice, the air compressor will give up, the jake will disengage, or someone will slam on the brakes in front of me. My destination is the ultra-rich haven called Aspen, Colorado. This makes perfect sense. I'm a long-haul mover at the pinnacle of the game. I'm a specialist. I can make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year doing high-end corporate relocation. No U-Hauls for me, thank you. I'll take the movie stars, the ambassadors, the corporate bigwigs. This Aspen load I'm hauling right now is insured for $3 million and belongs to a former investment banker from a former investment bank. <laughs> Apparently his personal loot is intact. <laughs> My cargo consists of a dozen crated modern art canvases, eight 600-pound granite gravestones of Qing Dynasty emperors, <laughs> half a dozen king-size pillow-top beds I'll never figure out how to assemble, <laughs> and an assortment of Edwardian antiques. The man I'm moving, known in the trade as the shipper, has purchased a $25 million starter castle in a hyper-secure Aspen subdivision. Enough about him. I'm still on Loveland Pass looking for brake lights. I can probably slow down, but there's no chance of coming to a quick stop. If I slam on the brakes, I'll either crash through the vehicle in front of me or go over the side. I want to smoke a cigarette, but I'm so wound up I could never light it, so I bite off what's left of my fingernails. I'm 58 years old. I've been doing this on and off since the 1970s. I've seen too many trucks smashed on the side of the road, too many accidents, too many spaced out drivers. On Interstate 80 in Wyoming, I saw a truck get blown over on its side in a windstorm. On Interstate 10 in Arizona, I saw a state trooper open the driver door of a car and witnessed a river of blood pour out onto the sand. That blood soaking into the sand can be mine at any time. All it takes is an instant of bad luck, inattention, a poor decision, equipment failure, or most likely, someone else's mistake. If that happens, I'm a dead man. That concludes the little reading part. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. So now we can uh, have a little discussion. If anybody's shy, um, we can always talk about driverless vehicles, <laughs> which are coming soon. Um, well, maybe we'll get to that in a minute. Does anybody uh, have anything to say here? Any of you drivers out there? Anybody else been scared? Yes, ma'am. So do you consider the road the road, and do you have a favorite part of the country that you like to drive in? Yes, I do have a favorite part I like to drive in, and, and this is a sort of a, it's sort of a, uh, it's a, it's an answer that's counterintuitive. I like to drive places where nothing happens. 
So when everybody complains about driving I-80 through Nebraska, I just love that. 880 miles of I-10 through Texas, fine with me. Boston, D.C., not so much. <laughs> But I do get to see some great places. And if, just to I want to pick a couple, um, Alligator Alley in Florida through the Everglades is a, one of the great drives in America. Uh, I, Interstate 84 along the Columbia River in Oregon is another amazing one. Um, 89 up to Burlington, Vermont, is nothing wrong with that one either. Those beautiful rolling hills, as long as it's sunny and dry. <laughs> Which it was today. I had a great, dry, great ride up. Um, the Southwest, you know, to Arizona, New Mexico, great. Um, yeah, those would be, those would be the, like my favorites. Sir. Well, I've driven over Loveland Pass and, and uh, Independence many times in the old days, and it's nasty in a car. <laughs> hey, forget about it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> a guy up here in a little town nearby built a great big mansion, and he was a mechanic at his local joint. And it turns out he invented a little flapper that goes on the top of the truck's exhaust pipe to keep the rain out. Oh, yeah. He's from here. I think he's dead, man, but he made a fortune on that little thing. Oh, they keep me awake every night because they go ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Yeah, tell him he's keeping about a million truck drivers awake every day. <laughs> yes? What, what kind of amenities do you have in your truck? Like bed, shower? Uh, no, I don't have a shower. I don't have a bathroom. Um, this is a brand new truck. It hasn't even been, I picked this up two months ago. It had 42 miles on it. It's got 10,000 miles on it now. Um, so it hasn't been tricked out yet with too many domestic amenities. Um, Sometimes I'll put it, I'll be putting in a refrigerator probably. Um, no shower, no bathroom, no cooking. I spend enough time in there. Um, I don't I don't need to be, yeah I don't need to be showering in there. No microwave or coffee pot. Nope. No microwave or coffee pot. I just carry it. With, I, I'm not going to bring a coffee pot. If I you know if my schedule is so that I can't stop and get a coffee, I mean. Uh, <laughs> If you can find a truck stop where you can park. If you can find a truck stop where you can park, that's the big thing. And so I drive a 53-foot trailer now, so I'm running about 73 feet long. 53s, you're only allowed to go certain places a certain distance off the highway. So it's getting harder and harder. Trucks are getting more and more like a train, and it's like on a track. Um, and then truck stops, restaurants are clo they're closing all the restaurants and uh, closing down a lot of truck stops. So it's hard to get anything to eat, although... Managing somehow. Yeah. Do you uh, spend the night in your truck sometimes, or do you always? Get always, almost always. Yep. Um, I'm spending tonight. Actually, at a friend of mine's in Hanover. Somebody who actually managed to graduate from Colby College. <laughs> actually, two people that managed to graduate from <laughs> Colby College. Um, so on this road trip here, this uh, been out for about 60 days. I've I got three hotel rooms. So I sleep, I love sleeping in the truck. It, I sleep better in the truck than I sleep at home. It's, uh, it's nice, you turn the engine on, you let it idle for a while, it warms up, it's nice and, I don't know, it's cocoonish, it's comfortable. You didn't need to get the guest room ready? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I did graduate from Colby. <laughs> um, uh, my, my avocation is driving across the country. Uh, been east and west on all the routes ten times, and I love it. It's my favorite sport. I know it's your job, but <clears throat> I wonder if you can tell me how the truck stops have changed in your time. I mean, for example, um, Little America in Wyoming, I think, was the biggest truck stop in the world at some point in the 50s, and now it's sort of a weird curiosity, and it's nothing. Uh, I-80, the biggest truck stop in the world in Iowa. In Wolcott. Yeah, it's kind of great, and I, I like it. I, I I've stopped there four times in the last two years. It's just sort of a Disneyland truck stop. I wonder, uh, what's your favorite? And then second question, when uh, last year, a year ago yesterday, I was in Kansas for the election at a truck stop, and um, it was entirely clear 
that it was no surprise at all, the result. And um, when I came back here 24 hours, 12 hours later, whatever it was, um, everybody was in tears and falling down. And, and I wonder if you have a sense, had a sense from driving um, about where we are and where we were headed and whether that was a surprise or not to you. Okay, well, the truck stop one first, I think. Um, Little America in Wyoming is a shadow of its former self when it used to just serve as truck drivers. There's a, the truck, tr truck stops in general are actually turning into something different um, because of all the RVs. Little America is actually an RV park now, mostly. Um, especially some, you know, those big, especially you see some really big ones, those big Greyhound bus type RVs and things like that. Um, the Iowa City, the Iowa 80 truck stop in Wolcott, Iowa, um, it's supposed to be the world's biggest truck stop. It's uh, that's still a pretty cool place. They've got the museum, they've got a doctor's office, they've got a barber shop. I think they should have a par three golf course, but they're not listening to that. Um, but you've got Pilot Flying J, which is one big company. Then you have TA Petro, which is the other big company. They comprise about a market share of probably 98% of the truck stops in the United States. Um, and they're closing most of the restaurants, so that's not, that's not really good for us. I still just like the small independent truck stop if you can find them. I mean, my favorite truck stop in America is Dysart's out outside of Bangor. You ever been up there? Dysart's is a great place. Um, and then, um, in, I, don't get very, I don't get political in my book at all. A um, couple of reasons. One is I'm not really sure about what's going on, and the other thing is I wanted to sell some books to <laughs> <laughs> to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think I can say this: I've got a very interesting seat as as somebody who does high end executive relocations, so, because the people I work for are the one percenters, and the people I work with are the people at the very bottom. And that's an interesting perch to see what the country looks like. And I don't think I'm getting too political to say that the, the gap in opportunities and, and earnings and assets between those two ends of each spectrum is probably broader than it could be. Never been worse. Never been worse. Well, he doesn't mind getting political. so. <laughs> Uh, but, but I will say this about truck driving. So the average wage for a truck driver hauling freight is about $35,000 a year. This is not a good, well-paying job. Now, there's, different, there's a bunch of differences, too. So if you're driving for a Federal Express, UPS, UPS is a Teamster shop. You've got Stop and Shop and things like that that are union shops. Those, those men and women are, are do definitely doing considerably better than that. And then you have specialized people like the high-end furniture movers like me who are doing considerably better than that. But most of these men and few women, 7% truck drivers are women, which has doubled in the last couple of years, but still only seven. Um, it's not a great job. It's not a middle-class job. And when, in 1980, when I started, it was very much a middle-class job. So like all... Not all, but like many middle class jobs, this has turned into something that's not you know, sustainable in terms of trying to keep a family together or something like that. So when people ask me, oh, you know, would you, what would you say to somebody who wanted to be a truck driver? I would say you better learn how to do something else in addition to driving. Learn how to move families so that they don't get all upset. Learn how to move specialized materials, something like that. And it's a better job, but it's still not a hugely high-paying job. Yes, in the back. Um, I read your book, and I loved your book. And you're a really good writer, so I want to know how that came about. Did you think about this for a long time? All of a sudden, one day, and a long time, you said, oh, I'm going to write a book. Tell us how it... I started talking into an audio cassette recorder back in the 80s. At the end of my work day, just to unwind, I'd start to talk about what happened during the day. And then I started doing it while I was driving because I was forgetting stuff. So if I saw something really weird on the road, then I, I would do that. And then I started doing it 
when I was interacting with the people that I was moving, surreptitiously and probably illegally. <laughs> and then I started doing it with the people that I work with and in the truck stops, restaurants, bars, waysides. So I had uh, this accumulation of decades of, this, of these audio tapes. And I had them transcribed about uh, four years ago or so and ended up with about 800 pages of stuff. And that's when I got serious about giving it some structure and uh, getting serious about making it into a book. But you'd never written, I mean, this is it so far? This is how good a writer you could be with only three years at Colby College. <laughs> 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 yes, sir, in the back. Well, actually, I'm married to the woman on my right, and I read the book. Uh, we read the same book, actually. Uh, <laughs> All in one day, and, swapping and, back and, and forth. Um, and so my congratulations to you, really, for uh, something that was well thought out, well presented, and, and an insight into a business that I had no idea about. But you mentioned that your family was a little disheartened when you dropped out of Colby after three of the four years. And, um, and I take it that there's been some reconciliation, given that you have a lot of sibs, and also your folks were alive at the time you started driving. So um, where are... Where are where where are you all now? Where are we all now? Yeah, so I come from this, I have seven brothers and sisters, a sort of quintessential Irish Catholic family. Everybody was going to go to college. Um, yeah, so when I left, uh, yeah, there was a big family problem with that. <laughs> they, they erased my name from the family Bible. <laughs> I thought that only happened in Victorian novels, but uh, my name's been reinstated in pencil. Uh, no, it, took a, it only took a couple of years, uh, but yeah, we're fine. We've got. I've got. In fact, uh, we don't have any of these. You know, we don't have any feuds going on in our big Irish family at all. We all get along great, and it's a good part of my life. Just like the driverless vehicles, how do you see coming down the pipe in terms of danger, reliability? So driverless vehicles, why do I see it coming down the pike is the question. Um, because of the danger, liability, and culpability. We're in such a driver utopia now. How could we, how could we ruin this? We're killing 41,000 people a year on our roads. A couple of years ago, it was 50,000. A couple of years before that, it was 38. It's always around 40. It's a bloodbath. We're so used to the number. We don't even think about it. You know who thinks about it is the poor state policeman pulling dead bodies out of cars. Every day, 143 dead bodies in America, sometimes more. What if that number got taken down to 200 because a machine can do it better? So I'm ambivalent about this. Who wants to see 2.5 million truck drivers thrown out of work on the one hand? On the other hand, well, here's, here's my prediction. So 30 years from now, my granddaughter's going to look at me and say, come on, you had a pedal on the floor that made it stop, <laughs> and a pedal to make it go, and a wheel to make it turn, and you all had your own? I'll bet you were killing 40,000 people a year on the roads. You savages. The second part of that is, I haven't seen anything like this since the space race. You've got the eight most aggressive, wealthy, rich, stubborn companies in the planet. Alphabet, Amazon, Tesla, Apple, Daimler-Benz, Ford, and BMW racing each other to be first in this. This is too much brains, too much capital, too much effort for this to fail. This is not going to fail. This is going to happen way sooner than we think. That's my, that's my prediction. And in fact, we're not going to be allowed to drive pretty soon because it's too dangerous and there's too many people killed. So if you're going to have your old Model T now, you're going to have to go, like, go to the driving track and drive it around. Because like, on the roads, it's, it's going to be machines all over the roads. 
So that's just the way it looks to me. Yes, sir, driver. And at least in every article I read for at least the next three to five years after all of this comes to about, there's going to be a driver in a cab of every single one of those autonomous trucks. There will be in the beginning, but the whole point of autonomous trucks is to get rid of drivers. At some point down the road. That's the whole reason. How long has it taken? Yeah, go back through history. What did you have a cell phone? I mean, in tw 10 years. Everything takes a long lead time. Fair enough. One of us is going to be right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen overnight. Yes, ma'am. Driving cross country, um, I noticed that mostly in the, in the Midwest where um, the truckers would flash their lights when it was safe for a car to pass or for you to pull them in front of them. Uh, is that something that you learn in a driving school to get to CDL or is that just a regional custom? I haven't noticed that lately. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So here's the here's my view on the flasher question. And maybe there's another driver who has an opinion too. Um, if I'm getting flashed in by another truck at night and I to tell me it's okay to come into the lane, um, I'm very appreciative of that. And then I flash my lights and thanks to and we do that back and forth. Uh, for a car, not so much because I'm not sure. Actually, I I know what the truck driver's intention is. I'm not sure what yours is. So it could be that you forgot to turn your brights off. It could be that you're telling me there's a deer in the road to get out of the way. I mean, it could be, I don't know what you mean, so I don't appreciate, a, I, don't, I don't care one way or another, but I don't, I wouldn't take that as a, as a message. Yes, sir. Uh, I was a teamster in the 60s for six or seven years, early 70s, in Boston, peddling float freight in the city. And I could go on uh, like the brook forever about the number of trucking companies that were then in existence in Boston and now are gone. What happened? Where did they all go? They got consolidated into some very, very large trucking companies like Werner, Schneider, Celadon, CR England, who, by the way, aren't union members and aren't doing that well. And what was there? A, was there a deregulation in there someplace? 1980-81. Yep. I was there. <laughs> and that had the effect of what? Well, it, it, it's exactly what happened with the airlines. So the airlines... Uh, I don't know how deep we want to get into this, but in 19, the Motor Carrier Act of 1935 regulated interstate, all interstate trucking except for agricultural goods. So that meant that freight rates were set by the federal government. So the shippers, the people who were paying trucks to drive things, had to pay a certain amount of money based on formula that were developed in Washington by truck, trucking industry lobbyists. So you had very high freight rates, and then you had very high labor rates, and you had a high rate of uni unionization because of all of those things. When deregulation came, th the freight rates fell by half almost overnight. And the management of these trucking companies, that was probably you know, overmanaged. And maybe some of the labor contracts were over generous or whatever. But the whole thing is flipped to the other side now in that you know, most truck drivers are sharecroppers. Two words, Ronald Reagan. Well, well, actually, it was Jimmy Carter who started it, but it ended with Reagan. On the other hand, it's good for the shippers, just the same way, you know, who, who, flew, who flew commercial airlines in the 1970s? That was a totally regulated market. It was really expensive. And then everything fell, all the prices dropped, and it was good for the consumer. But it's not good for the pilot. And this is that's the same answer. Uh, yes, sir. All the truck drivers that I've been involved with or know back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, you could go out there and work your ass off and make $200,000 a year as independent. After Ronald Reagan deregulation happened and the whole industry all kind of sivvied out and spread every here, there, and everywhere, all of a sudden they're all saying, don't go into the trucking industry. But they don't realize making $10 an hour down in Lebanon down here with no benefits and, and nothing to fall back on is one-tenth 
sense of what it is to go out and work on the road. You know, you say 35000 a year. I spent the last six months talking to truck drivers in Lebanon, and the lowest pay down there I've heard from anybody is fifty grand a year with full benefits. And you can, and I've had jobs offered to me all the way up to one hundred and fifty grand a year if I want to become an independent owner operator, take over their business. They'll finance me. Away I go. Three years later, all bought and paid for. Off I run. You know, it, 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 people don't realize there is an industry out there still to this day if you're willing to work it. Nobody wants to go out on the road for 28 days a month. Everybody no, 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 wants no. to go out on the road for three and a half to five days a month, a week, and be home. You know, it, it, it all it's all equal. If you want to work, it's out there. It, yeah, but not, I don't, I'm not sure about those kinds of... Uh, it, let's put it this way. If those freight companies that are making those kinds of offers... Um, we're delivering on those promises. They wouldn't have a 95% turnover rate every year. Yes, that's the problem. So there's your answer. And, they, and depending on the driver you talk to, there's either between 48,000 open jobs in this country to up to 400,000 open jobs. Well, if there was a truck driver shortage, then you'd think the pay would go up. But it hasn't. it hasn't, so there's no shortage. It hasn't. But the, the paper in the Valley News right here in town, there's been 5 to 12 job openings a, a, a day for local drivers. For local CDLA. Yeah. What are they paying? They're, they're, they're starting at 25 an hour. Well, that's because you're in Vermont. If you're in eastern Kentucky, you're starting at 8.50. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. You know, there's so much of up and down all over the place. That's the problem with not having a union. Exactly. Talk, talk to Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and all the people that come after him. I think he's dead. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. What are your favorite bookstores in the U.S.? Oh, <laughs> oh, that's setting me up to fail, don't you think? Well, I'll tell you my favorite bookstore to park in the U.S. is the Norwich Bookstore. <laughs> Oh, there's some amazing ones. Square Books in Oxford, Oxford, Mississippi. That's an amazing bookstore. Um, Powell's Bookstore in Portland, Maine is an amazing bookstore. Lemuria Books in Jackson, Mississippi, for some reason, is an amazing bookstore. Powell's in Portland, Maine. Oh, go ahead. Portland, did I say Portland, Maine? Yeah, Portland, Oregon. Yeah, it is. That's no problem. See, I live in an ocean of disorientation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> somebody to book a flight. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that, really. You go to the Wall um, Drug Store, do you? I've been to the Wall Drug Store. Yeah, yep, but it's not one of my favorite bookstores. No. No. Got other stuff. Yep, lots of good other stuff. Jackalopes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, you said that the truck you have now is, is uh, new, new one. Yes. Uh, how long does the truck last, and what makes you think, how do you know when you need a new one? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, you know you need a new one when it starts to break down more, more, more often than usual. Um, a truck like that, we can get 2 million miles out of it. Wow. Seriously. A diesel engine, a Class 8 diesel engine, is one of the greatest inventions on the planet. I mean, what else can you buy? That's $147,000. I could drive that for 20 years. After the first million miles, I might need to get an engine overhaul. It cost me maybe 20,000 bucks, and I'm good for another million miles. It's incredible. Yes, in the back. Along those lines, um, I was out in Utah about 10 years ago, middle of the night, and the, the rigs going by had three trailers. Triples. Yep. Those are the other wiggle wagons. Yeah, so what's the story with those kind of kind of rigs and, and how scared do you have do you get driving those? I've never driven a double or a triple. I'm never gonna drive a double or a triple. Uh, all I can imagine going downhill in this ice and snow, it's I don't know how they stay on the road. Well it was summer and it was I mean it was inter interstate and it was a straight shot and they yep. had to be going eighty. It's like a train. Holy yeah. Hell. yeah. In Australia, they've got them. They've got like eight of them. Yeah, it looks like a, looks like a choo-choo train. Yes? I'm driving. I have a truck. And the truck is 
saying that they're closed in the restaurant? You can get off. <laughs> I can't get off. I got nowhere to park. <laughs> because I really do. I I travel I mean I'm not going to go I went across the country miles and I really do like the truck stop because if I have a problem, it always is very, very nice to me at the, you know, and probably gouge the I don't know, but no, they, they just seem to be very helpful. And, but I don't, why are they getting rid of the restaurants, I guess? Because they're they're expensive. It's it's easier to to lease to a subway franchise than to run your own restaurant. Oh, there'll be food there. There'll be Carl's. Oh, yeah, there'll be plenty of food. You just won't be able to get you know chipped beef on toast or the mashed potatoes and gravy, and a lobster roll. That's all right. But truck. You know, this, uh, but this woman brings up a good point. Truck stops are not and it shouldn't be an intimidating place for four wheel drivers. Um, much there, you know. You you hear all these stories. Very. There's a few notorious truck stops. There's one east of Los Angeles. There's one outside of Chicago that are pretty nasty places. But most of them are okay. And now we have a lot of more. There's a lot more women and men, husband wife teams running teams. Yep. Um, there's a lot more women on, in the truck stops than there used to be. And I think men tend to behave slightly better when women are around. <laughs> So it is a good thing if you're out there, you know, on your road, on your own doing a road trip, oh, yeah. hang out in those truck stops. Yep. I, I do like oh, well. Yes. I work with children in all kinds of ways, um, and one of the groups of children I work with is angry little boys, and a lot of times they're really angry because they can't find anything they want to read, so they're not reading. And so I had the idea that if somebody could write truck books for them, it would be really cool. But these little boys know trucks so well, they would have to be an expert. <laughs> I mean, they would ask me if I tried to write a book about trucks. <laughs> They'd be like, that's not a truck. You know, so, <laughs> so I wonder about, is there any way to get this into second grade language for like Diary of the Wimpy Truck. Or <laughs> <laughs> there are tr little kid trucks books out, books out there, aren't they? I don't know. Every time I look at trucking, because I'm always looking for trucking books, and uh, you know, every time I sort of look around for one at a library or my local independent bookstore, I always see lots of little kids' truck books. I don't know. They're little kids, but they're not chapter books. Chapter books. Yeah. Oh, I see. You want a story, uh, a good story. You want a good story without any bad words in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Can't help you. <laughs> you know, so I'm going out looking for truckers, but they won't talk to me. <laughs> Why wouldn't they talk to you? I don't know. I'm like, Hi, I'm really interested in the truck story. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a little bit. Um, their trucks are smaller. Um, they think we have it real easy because we have these big giant interstates and they got to go through these little towns. Um, but they're already there's already driverless trucks in West Germ in Germany. So that's so it's already begun. So. You know, I've, so in this book. Um, in this chapter, I have a chapter about the finishing what I was reading about in Aspen, um, and I parked right down on South Mill Street, and you'll read it why if you buy the book. <laughs> Uh-oh, here comes Liza. Thank you all very much.